I suppose there's uh, no theme more obviously affecting and tugging at the emotions than the health of one's own children. And the first two poems I'm going to read um, are very much in that zone. Um, my son had um, congenital difficulties um, and uh, they lasted. Um, and this became impossible not to write about, but also very difficult to write about. And one way in was simply the language of that medical world. Not, I mean, the, the neologisms, which are some of them quite impenetrable to the layman, but an odd use of a very common word. At least it struck me as odd when I first heard it. And that's the subject in a way, or the way in at least, to the first poem, which is called post-operative. Not a cut, but a wound, the doctors always called it. As if wanting to say that no unkindness was meant, but that there's also, besides bleeding, it would cause hurt too. Not a cut, but a wound, so that three years after, when at night our son sings bravely to himself for hours, his mother still sighs and says, he is afraid, he remembers. And when rubbing him dry, I brush the ridge of scar, I wince and search his eyes for evidence, not of a cut, but a wound that will not heal. Shall I sing to you? I ask. Well, the next poem on the same subject is set some 10 years later. And um, I didn't actually publish it for some years after that. It's called simply Father to Son. No one would know unless they actually knew or even notice the drab brown building facing the Apollo supermarket. Once inside, traffic noise or the odd branch waving from beyond the window are insufficient distractions from evidence which multiplies in folders. Time that aches and aches in clinic queues and the outraged screams of children. Each time we go, my heart begins to sink almost as much as yours must. Most of all, when we first glimpse beyond a door, then confront those alien machines, grotesque or sleek, whose circuits you, their missing part, must complete. With all their tubes, dials, monitors and screens, we have to trust them as benign, despite the pain they may also bring. Beyond all this, the caring smiles and skills of nurses and radiographers and of the doctors so famous that jet lagged, they have to ring in from the airport to give the go ahead for pre meds. Beyond the knowledge, too, that others are suffering more, a part of you still craves a chance to reject it all. And part of me, confounded by love and fear, would almost sign a pact as your accomplice. Anything rather than more tinkering to cope with a defect no one can help. Almost. Forgive that qualifying doubt whose other side is hope. Beyond a certain point of bruising, neither can talk of this. Occasionally I have them been in hospital myself and I thought always that I would not particularly want to write about that kind of experience. But in a funny way, with this next poem, I didn't have the choice. And of course, that's a good moment and a good imperative, um, which can lead to the writing of a poem, the feeling that it just has to happen. 
and this was a, during a short stay in the cardiac department um, of our local hospital, our excellent local hospital, and it refers to a song, um, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts, which as you'll hear, um, put in a rather incongruous appearance. Coconuts in the cardiac ward. Hospital, more or less darkness, and all with a one way or another faulty heart laid out in a row. Finally, with someone's nebulizer off and the voice shouting no from a side room, giving up, more or less quiet. And then, from the 83-year-old builder in the next door bed, a single line sung happily in his sleep. There they are, all standing in a row. And yes, somehow they are, cupped awry in their red and white holders, various as humans, and each hairy fruit of the mercy, its white milk cocooned in the night like a long-held hope. Sometimes it's just a word that triggers a poem. And the word that triggers this next one was atropine, um, a muscle relaxant, um, and which owes its name, of course, to Atropos, um, the oldest of the three fates in Greek mythology. And she was the one who had the shears with which she could snip the thread of one of the other fates. I mean, held by one of the other fates. So the duration of your life was decided by Atropos and her shears. Going home. He heard from behind his head the burly anaesthetist calling for the atropine and the high ceiling of the ward began to cut out neatly in square blocks. She came to him dressed in white like a nurse or perhaps a bride instructed to assist. Over her shoulder, he saw a narrowing tunnel, all that must be relinquished. He could imagine coming too, signing the discharge papers drinking tea, going home, but not how to erase her image or forget the snap of her bright shears. Well, the poets particularly, but for everyone really, the heart is much more than a muscle with all its associations and not just the debased uh, forms we see on the 14th of February, but much more widely than that. And here's a poem uh, called Heart Song, which takes off from two lines by Yeats in his poem, A Song. Oh, who could have foretold that the heart grows old? Heart Song. The locked diary of the heart stores the complete record in its brisk two-step, the times when fear or love made it miss a beat, sink or leap. Although it never accuses, it logs your case exactly. Its archive holds each crazy wish, each excess, every instance that has caused it to soften or harden. And one day, when perhaps the doctors come to interpret its scars, its peaks and troughs, you reading over their shoulders will see that the heart has remained as innocent as the earth itself. And finally, um, poem that rounds to silence, as indeed my mother at the end of her life rounded to silence. And that's something that 
um, I found haunting and memorable and that in time I came to write about and I suppose to come full circle to the entries for the poetry competition I think there's a fine point between the strength of an emotion, the distance necessary to embody it in a poem, but also the role that form can play and rhythm in intensifying the original feeling, not diluting it. Shine. It was all curtailed by then. Your home rendered to a home. Your car to a small check, your love of travel to a short walk in the garden, your furniture to what would fit into one room. So where did it come from, that radiance which took possession of your features? Your gaze was shine, all shine, and seemed to fix on something out of sight. You smiled as if greeting a guest. An ecstasy that bordered on rapture, it had nothing to say. If spoken to, you were speechless, not so much astonished as taken up with something else altogether. At the point of no return, perhaps, with simply nothing more to be said, even to your children. You spent the whole of your last week in that glow and did not speak again. Lawrence Seale, thank you very much indeed.